So one of our main goals in the second semester of real analysis is to get a thorough understanding of what continuous functions from the real numbers to the real numbers actually are. I like to think of the set of continuous functions as being some enormous haystack. And hay is pretty nice. Hay is pretty tasty. Um, but hay is also really big. And within that haystack, there are some really, really nice kinds of functions, the kinds we might be able to do calculus with, or the things that we might be able to use to solve differential equations. Or there's all kinds of like special little needles inside of that haystack, but the haystack's really big. And so we've got to get an understanding of what the hay actually is. What are these continuous functions? And we want to do that in a way that gets us beyond the somewhat superficial understanding that we build when we sort of take the foundations of calculus for granted. You know the one. That's not continuous, because if I draw the graph, I have to lift my pencil. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard to listen to that voice. So how do we get past that calculus level of understanding to a way that actually helps us to wrestle with the definition of the real numbers? What is it about the real number system that makes continuous functions do what they do on the real line? So in this video, we're going to review the main definitions of what makes a function a continuous function on the real line. And then in the couple videos after that, we're going to put some different lenses on it to see that continuity is not something that's special just to the real numbers per se, but that continuous functions are actually a topological idea, that we can define continuity not necessarily just based on real numbers and absolute values, but we can define them based on things like sets and sequences. And that's going to help us immensely in the future to be able to use whichever perspective on continuous functions that we might need in order to get a result that we're looking for. So let's go. All right, I guess we should start back in our calculus class. So what do we know about continuous functions in calculus? Well, we know that they have something to do with limits, and that's why we end up talking about them in calculus so much. Um, and continuity, from a calculus perspective, has these three different legs of the stool, and if any one of these legs is broken or missing, then continuity is going to fail. In order to have a continuous function at a point of its domain x0, we need all three of these legs to be standing. And the first one is that the function has to be defined at the point in question. This point has to be a point of the domain of the function, so f of x0 has to exist. The other leg of the stool is that the limit of the function f as x approaches x0 also must exist. This is the piece that makes it a calculus question. But when we first encountered this question about continuity in calculus, usually it comes in the same chapter that we're sort of first learning about what limits are and where they come from in the first place, um, at least in as much as we can in a calculus class. And so often we think of this leg of the stool, the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x existing, as having three separate pieces. Because at this point, we're also thinking about what left-hand limits and right-hand limits might entail in our calculus class. So we need the left-hand limit as we approach x0 to exist. We need the right-hand limit as we approach x0 to exist. And then we also need those left and right-hand limits to agree with one another. So this one leg of our continuity stool, the leg that says that the limit must exist, really kind of has three pieces to it. And in order for that leg to hold up the stool, all three of those pieces need to be in place. If my function doesn't have a right-hand limit, or if it has right and left-hand limits, but they don't agree with one another, those get us sort of different kinds of discontinuities in the shape of the graph of our function, and so our stool will fall over. But then what is the big picture? What is the third leg of the continuity stool? We need the value of the function at x0 to exist. We need the limit of the function, its value as we get near x equals x0. We need that to exist. But we also need those two things to be telling us the same story. We need that the limit of my function as I approach x0 agrees with the value of my function at x0. The story being told by the nearby points in the domain to x0 is the same as the story being told by the very point, x0, at that point in the domain. So this is typically how we understand what continuity means from a calculus perspective. And so the definition for continuity that we see in our calculus textbooks tends to look something like this. f is continuous at a point x0 whenever the limit of f of x as x approaches x0 agrees with the value of f at x0. But we, of course, want to set the bar a little bit higher for ourselves. Uh, we have sort of been through calculus, and it is now time to put aside childish things and think in an analysis framework, what does this actually mean? And in particular, the thing that's unclear, except from an analysis framework, is what should the limit of a function actually mean in a real analysis sort of perspective? 
So we have to have some understanding of what is limit of f of x as x approaches x naught. So just a review of the definition of the limit of a function from our first semester of analysis. The limit of a function f of x as x approaches a point x naught, and it's uh, possibly in its domain, but possibly not, right? This limit is equal to some real number, capital L. If the following thing is true, so I have a point x naught in the domain, I have its image f of x naught in the codomain of my function. And the limit of f of x as x approaches x naught should equal capital L, in this case capital L, the role of capital L is being played by f of x naught, that that should equal that limit if I can get as close to the y value that I would like to get to as I would like by getting as close to the x value as I need to. And so the typical picture that gets set up looks something like this. However close to this limit value that you would like me to get, I should be able, in turn, to make all of the values of my function be that close to capital L, the value that we want, just by making the x values that I pick close enough to x naught. So I can get as close on the y-axis to capital L as you want me to, just by getting as close to x naught on the x-axis as I need to in order to make that happen. So it's this give and take. You tell me how close you want me to get to the value of the limit, capital L, and then I go and I find how close do I have to get to x naught in order that all of my x values that are within that distance of x naught are going to have their y values that are that close to capital L. So on the graph, what it ends up looking like is something like this. You choose for me a sort of a, a target radius. So how close do you want me to get my y values to this capital L? And so you pick this sort of radius and it defines for me kind of a little piece, a little chunk of the y-axis that is sort of plus or minus a certain distance from the limit, the purported limit, capital L. And we're just gonna call that distance the radius of that interval, we're going to call that radius epsilon. So you tell me, I want you to get epsilon close to the value that we claim that this limit has. Right? Whatever epsilon that you choose for me, I don't have the ability to control that. And so what I need to do in turn is then I need to figure out how close do I need to get to my value x naught in order to get the y values of those points to be within the purported uh, distance of the limit. And so the picture that's getting set up here is that if I can get close enough to x naught, if I can get my x values to be within this green portion of the x-axis, then all of the y values of the points on the graph that have those x values, all of those y values are going to be within this purple interval on the y-axis. And if you choose a different epsilon for me, if you want me to get closer than before, then I probably have to choose a different delta. I have to get closer to my x naught. You want to get closer to L, I have to get closer to x naught. If you let us be further away from L, I can probably let us be further away from x naught. But the point is that whichever, however close you want to get to our limit, we can get that close just by getting as close as we need to to x naught. So from a notation perspective, this however close to L, this is the number that we often call epsilon in analysis. This is the target that you're setting for me. This is how close we're trying to get to L on the y-axis. And then we'll call the, the, the close to x naught, how close do we have to get on the x-axis to x naught, we'll call that delta. And so then the way that this definition for the limit of a function f of x as x approaches x naught to be equal to a real number L means that any value of x that is this close to x naught, delta close to x naught, will have a y value, f of x, that is this close to our limit value, uh, l, right? So epsilon close to l. Every x which is delta close to x naught has its f of x epsilon close to l. And so just to put quantifiers back into this, right, to be delta close to uh, x naught means that we're picking all the x values for which the absolute value of x minus x naught is less than delta. So this is all of the x's in the interval from x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta on the x-axis on our graph paper, if you'd like. And then same thing for being epsilon close to L on the y-axis. What that really means is that the absolute value of f of x minus L is less than epsilon. And so we're saying that any time an x value for which uh, we are within a delta's distance of x naught, we will have our f of x value within epsilon of L. 
Now we just need to add in the quantifiers. And the quantifiers are going to come from the observation that the epsilon, how close we're trying to get to the limit, is something that we don't get to choose. It's something that you're kind of choosing for me. You're setting a target. And so this thing that we do should work no matter what value of epsilon is chosen. If you choose it to be really large or if you choose it to be really small, as long as you choose it to be something positive, we can actually make this thing happen. So for all epsilon greater than zero, I then must be able to find a delta for which all the x's which are delta close to x naught will have f of x's that are epsilon close to the limit l. So this was the definition of what a limit of a function means from an analysis standpoint. So in the next video, let's take this one step further and just use this definition of limit, plug it into our definition of what it meant for a function to be continuous. And in doing so, sort of get a one-stop definition for what it means for a function to be continuous using this epsilon and delta formalism that comes from the definition underneath me here of the limit of a function.